And we have reached uh, chapter 18. And to today we'll be looking at uh, verse 15 to 20. Verse 15 to 20. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he doesn't listen, take one or two others along with you, and every charge may be established by evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as Gentile and tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you buy on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Again I say to you, if two or three, if two of you agree on earth about anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there, are, there am I among you. It is obvious that this text, the theme of this text is clear. It's talking about how to handle sinning brothers. Look at verse 15. Verse 15 says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him when he is alone. So it's quite clear that how to handle sin in the church. The outline is also equally clear. The first point is the purpose of discipline. You look at verse 15 again. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault and between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So the purpose of discipline is, is to gain back your brother is redemptive. We'll talk more about this. And the second point is really the the first point is the purpose of discipline. Second point is the process of discipline. Again, look at verse 15. And in fact, verse 15 to 17 are the process. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him alone. Verse 16, if he does not listen, then take two or three. Uh, then verse 17, if he refuses to listen to two or three, tell it to the church. If he refuses to tell the to listen, even listen to the church, then treat him like Gentile and tax collector. There you see they lay out a process, a, a, a process how to handle uh, this uh, uh, wayward Christian. And lastly, we'll be on verse 18 and 20. It's talking about the power, really talking about the authority of discipline. Verse 18 said, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. We will explain more in details, but it's quite clear that the, the outline is very clearly spelled out here. We have many parents among us, and uh, what do you do if you encounter children who are stubborn and refuse to be corrected? Will you continue, will you let them continue their destructive behavior? What should you do? Do you leave them alone? Of course not. We will endeavor to discipline them in order to save him from his destructive behavior. That is the point of this text. What if a Christian brother continues to sin? What should we do? Should we ignore him? Of course not. We will endeavor to bring him back to the Lord. And this is what happened, what we see in uh, Hebrew chapter 12 as well. For the Lord disciplined the one he loves and chastised every son who he received. So, and in continue, he says that in verse 8, verse 7 says, For what son is there whom his father does not discipline if you left if you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So you can see that even the father, our, our early father also disciplined us in verse 9, Hebrew chapter 12, verse 9 says, Beside this, we have early father who disciplined us 
and who res we respected them, shall we not much more be subjected to the Father of the Spirit and live? For they discipline us for short time as, as, as it seemed best to them, but he, he, meaning God, disciplined us for our good and we may share his holiness. Is holiness important in the church? Of course. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, say that you shall be holy because I'm holy. Of course, this is taken from Leviticus 11.44. And I would like to remind you the context of chapter 18. And we, and we have spent quite a long time in our uh, study of book of Matthew. And we have come to 18 and we reminded uh, everyone that this is the fourth discourse in the five, in, in Matthew, there are five major discourses, lengthy teaching from Jesus Christ. This is number four. And in number four that you realize that the focus is on the little ones. In, in fact, uh, if you remember, if you have your Bible turned to uh, verse one, he said that when the disciples gather together and they, they start arguing who are the greatest, and Jesus calling a child before them and say to them that unless you become like a children, uh, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Basically, if you don't humble yourself, you're not safe. I say again, if you do not humble yourself, just like the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus said that unless you are... Make unless you are broken hearted, unless you are bankrupt in your spirit, unless you are poor in spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's basically unless you see your your yourself, your sins, that unless you are we talk about this in in the <clears throat> in first century, children have no right. In fact, they can be sold to as slavery. And <clears throat> so the children have no right unless you become helpless, become powerless like children, totally depending on God the Father, you cannot be saved. So if, in fact, he says that in verse 2, that truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you never enter the kingdom of heaven. If you do not humble, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And then verse 4 says, whoever humble himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So since you, we have to be humble, we have to humble ourselves before we enter the kingdom of heaven, then all Christians who enter the kingdom of heaven who are saved, supposed to be humble, like the child. So that means all Christians are greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So it says that the focus is still on the children or the, the child. Then verse 5 says, whoever receive one child in my name, receive me, and whoever cause one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it's better for him to have a great millstone and drown in the depth of the sea. So basically, he's talking about, look, if we don't insist our right, if we humble ourselves, if we do not prop up ourselves, we will, we will despise by the world. But the Lord said that, yes, in, indeed, you will. But the point is that once you enter, in, once you enter in the kingdom, once you in, enter the church, we, as a church, we should not, we should receive you, we should receive one another, and we, will not, we should not cause one another to stumble. And verse 10 said, we should not despise the little ones. That's, therefore, the little ones, the, the children, are all referring to Christian. So last week, we did talk about the whole um, message there is talking about relationship between brothers and sisters. So we talk about the, uh, we are encouraged to receive one another. We are exhorted not to stumble each other and we are enjoined to not to despise any brothers. If we do that, then what about brothers who continue in sin, who refuse to repent and refuse to to, to be corrected, what do we do? That's why this text come before us. And this text is really talking about discipline of the church or discipline of believers. Notice in verse 15, he said, if your brother sins. 
He's talking about believers. He's talking about Christian. He's talking about so-called brothers. So we are here talking about within the context of the church. So if a brother sin, what do we do? In fact, this text in, in Paul, he also teaches the same thing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he said that, Paul said that I wrote to you in my letter not to, not to associate. Notice that not to associate with sexual immoral people. Not that all meaning the, all sexual immoral of this world or greedy or swindler or idolaters, since they since then you would never you will need to go out of this world verse 11 but now i'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality greek isolate idolater or uh, reviler and drunkard and swindler and so on so we are talking about not people outside the church we are talking about inside the church if christian inside the church call themselves are saved and yet continue in sin what do we do so this is the text the context of this text is really within the church within the relationship of the church question is this today holiness is not important anymore in the church if you, if you disagree with me if you disagree with me you see how many scandals come out from Christian church. Of course, last week we already saw, in fact, uh, or, or two weeks ago, we saw the founder of Hillsong, Brian Houston, was or resigned or being fired uh, because he wrote an a inappropriate text message to a female and then one of the night that he was, uh, during the conference, he went into a, stranger, a strange woman's uh, uh, room and spent time there. So all these are ridiculous. You can see that this is the Christian church, the, the full-time pastors, leaders, not even care about holiness. And of course, not to mention this name, of course, we are, we are already very uh, sick and tired of, of hearing all these names. Um, uh, Joshua Harris, and uh, as well as uh, Billy Graham's grandson, who, who have a lot of uh, immoral uh, failing as well. And of course, not to mention uh, many more that we are talking about. So today, Christian church is no longer paying attention to holiness. And I have to tell you that, yes, we talk about love, but God is equally emphasized to us that His holiness is the key. Why He save us? He save us from sin. And if He save us from sin, why are we continuing in sin? If we continue in sin, it means we are not saved. He didn't save us at all. So holiness is the key important in church and we have to be very strict about this and we need to protect, we need to... If the church, if the Christian continue in sin, what testimony is there? What glory does the Lord get? So we have to make sure that the holiness of the church is protected. Therefore, this passage is telling us how, what should we do in the church if Christian refuse to obey, refuse to be holy, refuse to obey the Lord. But of course, I'm sure there are people who say, why do you judge people? Christian, we shall not judge. And they will always easily go to Matthew chapter 7, say, judge not that you, you be not, judge not that you be not judged. And we, we go through this text before, uh, but if you look at this text, if you take I in isolation, you probably believe that, yeah, in that case, we should not judge at all. But if you look at the text, what the text say, that it say, look, you should not judge unless you be judged. And, and Jesus Christ basically say in verse 3, say, why do you see that the speck that in your brother's eyes, but do not notice the, the lock in your own eyes? Meaning, you can see all the final minute details of the sin that or your brother but you cannot see the huge lock in your own eyes of course this is a metaphor because you cannot have a lock in your eyes because otherwise you'll be smashed into into uh, pieces so here is is really a hyperbole is really a exaggeration like look you have such a big sin in your life you cannot see you you're going to uh, um, 
pick on your brothers. So in this case, are you saying that we should not judge? If that is the case, then we should not judge. But you see, verse 5, Jesus said this, You hypocrite, first take out the lock of your own eyes, and then you see clearly to take out the speck of your brother's eyes. So is that saying that, oh, in that case, you should not take out your, your speck of uh, the, 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 your, your brother's eyes. No, he said, look, handle your own sin first. Repent first. Until you learn that you be exemplary for others, now you start and protect the, 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 the testimony of the church, the glory of, of God, and tell everyone, come back, repent, and live a holy life. So in, in verse 5, if he's asking us not to judge, in that case, we, we were not able to, to take out the, the, the speck of our brother's eyes. And if you recall in 1 Corinthians that Paul wrote there about a sinning brothers, and then he said that like, you should not associate with, with all the, all the uh, so-called brothers who continue in sins, which I showed you earlier. He said, he said, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 again, he said, now that I'm writing to you not to, not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, meaning he called himself brothers, if he is guilty, you call yourself brother, yet you are guilty of sexual immorality, greed, idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such person, not even to eat with such person. For what have I to do with judging outsider? It is not those inside the church who are to judge. Now, look at this verse. Are we to judge or not to judge? It's clear that Paul is saying that you are the inside the church, uh, uh, we are the judge. Outside the church, God judge those outside, purge the evil one from among you. So are we to judge or not to judge? Of course, we are too, according to the scripture. And again, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Or do you not know that the saint will judge the world if the world is to be judged by you? Are you incompetent to trial trivial cases? Do you, not, do, you, do you not know that we are to judge angels how much more than matters pertaining to this life? So the question is, to judge or not to judge? Of course, in this case, we need to know. We need to judge. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12 says, For what have I to do with judging outsider? It is not the inside the church that whom you are to judge. God judge those outsider and purge the evil person from the among you. Of course, in the, in the Bible, there are many, if you do a search on judge, you'll see that sometimes it asks you to judge, sometimes it asks you not to judge. Therefore, you have to categorize them. What you can judge and what you cannot judge. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, chapter 4, verse 5 says, Therefore do not pronounce judgment before time, before the Lord comes, who will bring the, to light the things that are hidden in darkness and who disclose the purpose of the heart. The question is this. When we say to judge and not to judge, first thing you must discern the context. Here it's talking about, if you look at the context, there are, the, the Corinthian church, the Christian in the Corinthian church are arguing who is, the, who is uh, more important. Is it Apollo? Is it Paul? Is it Peter? And then he's talking about each person. He said, look, don't judge the heart. But Paul said, when you come to behavior so clear-cut, blatant sin, you have to be very clear, you have to be very firm. We will not judge the heart, but when it comes to Outward behavior is so evident and we have to take action. That is what it's all about. And of course, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 says, Paul said, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Meaning that we should not allow a little bit 
even a little bit of leaven in our life, not sin. So we have to be drastically deal with sin. Remember, if, if your hands make you sin, cut it down. If your eyes make you sin, crouch it out. So basically, this is what he's talking about. Of course, here we are talking about, uh, it's a hyperbole, it's talking about how to treat your sins seriously, not to let small little sins creep in. So let me return to our first point, the purpose of discipline. The purpose of discipline. Of course, if you look at verse 5, if your brother sins against you, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone, if he listens to you, you gain your brother. The word gain basically is talking about, generally the word Cardeno is talking about financial gain. It's talking about profit. But of course, it's used here to say you take something valuable back. You remember Jesus Christ's uh, uh, parable said that if there are person who have 100 sheep, and then if he lost one, he will go, he will leave the 99 and go out to search for, for that lost sheep, and he do not want to see one perish. And this is basically the context of this text. If you look at uh, verse 14 upwards, you will see that this is exactly what Jesus said. So Jesus just said that if a, per, if a man lost one, one sheep, go, astri- go wayward, he will leave the 99 and find that one. Then he said, if a brother sin. So this is a continuation. In the context, it's talking about redemptive. Israel is talking about how to bring back a, a wayward uh, <coughs> child or Christian. And in fact, it's very interesting. After this text, next week, we are talking about forgiveness. And Peter went to, uh, in verse 18, Peter went to Jesus and said, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Is it seven times? Jesus said, no, 77 times. You see, this, is san- this text is really sandwiched between forgiveness and losing the one sheep uh, among the ni- uh, 99. And in between, he's talking about how to what if a brother sin? What if a brother went astray? How, what should we do? We should be go out all the way to bring him back. If he, if he repent, forgive him. So this text is really redemptive in purpose. We are not here to judge and say, oh, you sin, I will condemn you to hell. This is not the purpose. The purpose is to bring you back with love, with gentleness. That's what we like to do. And in fact, Galatians chapter 1 says the same thing. Brothers, if anyone caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in, spirit, in the spirit of gentleness. Of course, keep yourself, keep watch on yourself, lest that you too tempered, are tempted. Bear one another's burden so that so fulfill the law of Christ. So you can see it's quite clear here that we is talking about redemptive. The whole thing is talking about redemptive and how to bring back the wayward uh, brothers. James 5, 19 say the same thing. He said, my brothers, 5, 19 say, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone bring him back, let him know what? Let him know that whoever bring back a sinner from wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sin. So here we can see that we have to be very clear that this is talking about the purpose is to bring back. The purpose is redemptive in purpose. So our first point has to be very clear in the purpose of discipline. Our second point is the process. If that's the case, how do we go about bringing back a wayward Christian? So look at verse 15 again. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him in his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained him, gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him to be to you as Gentile and tax collector. Now you can see that he laid out the procedure. If the brother sin, go and get him back. If he refused to listen to you, 
then bring two or three. If you refuse to listen to two or three, go and tell to the church. If you refer to the, 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 the church, then what you should do. Therefore, the procedure is this. First thing, it has to be private. Second thing, it has to be plural, meaning two or three, or one or two to, to bring to them. And the third point is, if you even refuse to listen to two or three, then you have to tell it, you have to make public in the church. And finally, if he refused to listen to the church, you have to cast him out, ostracize him. We'll talk more about this. Of course, this is really in, in Christian churches, or uh, even in common, uh, all the scholars, they disagree or disagree. This is right. Three-step three approach or four-step approach. Uh, we, will, we will look into that. So first of all, let me look at the first point. It is talking about, it is, if a brother sins against you, you look at the word alone, meaning that you have to handle this privately. You have to go to him privately. Privately. You have to be personal. You have to be one-on-one. -on -one. So if you look at the text again, I will spend a little bit of time here. If, you, if your brother, so you are talking about Christian, you are not talking about people outside the church. So it's highlighting a Christian brother. If a Christian brother sin, he is a believer. If he sin, what do you do? And the word sin, I want to highlight to you. It's not, it, it, I don't want to give you a blank check that, oh, from now onward, I'll just pick and find everybody and find out all their sins. Here, the word sins is basically blatant disregard of God's law. If you want to bring church discipline, you must be very clear that he clearly violate the principle or the, the God's law without question. So I just want to highlight very important things to you. When you bring this out, first thing, it has to be biblical, it has to be direct. Disregard God's command. Secondly, it has to be facts, not feeling. It has to be facts, not feeling. It, it, you have to show proof. It's not like, I feel that you are, you are sinning. It's not. In fact, we have here so many of such. It's not. In fact, we, you, we have to be very, very careful. You have to provide proof, not just hearsay. In fact, James, James said this, do not speak evil against one another. The one who speaks against a brother judges his brother and, and speaks against the law and judges the law. Basically, is this. If you hear somebody say somebody, if not first-hand information, you should not even talk about it. In fact, you should say, if this is true, the person who saw it has to deal with it himself, not you. If you hear it from somebody else, you say, look, I, I didn't see it, I didn't hear it you have to tell the person you should stop talking about this. You should go and find that person, the, Christ, the sinning brothers, alone when he is private, confront him and get him to repent. And you should not even talk about it. If he repents, so all these things are done privately. Should, and the, if the brother, sinning brothers repent, you should not even talk about it. You should not even tell any other person. In fact, all this has to be done quietly. Only if he refused to repent, then you have to show, I have to bring another uh, two, one, one or two, that makes two, two or three. Because you plus one or two make three. And that, that will be, become a, a even, like in the Old Testament, it become like a, a legal proceeding already. So here, I just want to make sure you understand this. We will take this, we'll take action if it's clear command of the Bible, not ambiguous teaching. Sometimes some teaching are not so, not the major doctrine of the church or the not clear. We want to be very careful and we want to be conscious about, conscious about uh, weak conscience. Uh, so we are not dealing with uh, the weak conscience, but we are dealing with clear command of the Bible. And secondly, it has to be facts. You have to have proof. If you do not have proof, you will not proceed. And then it is your first-hand information, not, not from hearsay. And we continue to uh, look at the text. 
if your brother sin against you, okay, you say, oh, it's not against me, it's against somebody else, none of my problem. I don't want to be busybody. Let me tell you, the phrase against you is not the original script. It's not in the original script. The best original script, the best manuscript do not contain these two words, against you. And we, we, when we study, remember, we, uh, Chi Peng take us through uh, on uh, the, the book, uh, Gospel of Mark, we spend some time talking about how do we ascertain the scripture is the genuine one. So we know this is, if it's not in the early manuscript, then this is not part of it. So if you know, if you come to the knowledge that someone in sin, and we have to call out sin as sin, and we have to confront the person privately, so it says that if you see a brother's, if you see a brother's, if your brother sins, then skip against you, then go and tell him. Go and tell him. Let me highlight to you. M many of us refuse to confront anyone because you are bringing trouble to yourself. Don't just, I, this is my, my business. I don't even care, you know, if you, if you, it's you and, and God, nothing to do with me. But I want to tell you the word go is imperative. It's a command. If you have knowledge of someone truly in sin, you have the command of God to say you must go. It's not optional. You must go and tell him. And say, look, it's not. In fact, go and tell him. The word tell is almost like uh, lighten up the whole. It's basically go and reprove, rebuild him. And the word rebuild is basically has the meaning of bring light, expose the situation. And the word is, uh, Ellen Cole has the word, has the meaning of not only just to ex expose, but to prove to him that you are in the sin. So you must have evidence. You must show them, look, this is clear cut case that you are in sin. If it's not clear cut case, you have to pray hard that this. And, and be very careful not to abuse this, this proceeding. So you, unless you have hard evidence, you have to confront him and convict him so that he, he cannot run. That's what the meaning of the word reproof. In fact, uh, so, so it's not just go and tell. And then if he doesn't listen, never mind. No, it's go and prepare yourself and convict him with evidence. Say, this, this is it. And he cannot escape from the evidence and he said, look, it is. And if he repent, you gain your brother. So, in fact, and, and here he say that alone. Again, one-on-one, -on -one, alone. So let me summarize it. When we see a brother, first thing, it has to be a brother in church. Second thing, it has to be clear command, violation of clear command. And then thirdly, you have to go and show him your proof that he is he is uh, in sin, and then you have to do it privately. Privately. And if he repents, if he listens to you, he repents, you gain your brother. Just now I'm talking about you gain the valuable things back. So it's very important that you gain your, gain your brother. So the first point, the sub point is he has to be private, personal, private. Second point is is plural, meaning you have to bring two or three. So in verse 16, but if he does not listen, take one or two along with you, and one or two plus you become two or three. So bring one or, one or two others along with you, that every charge, the word charge become a serious con, uh, offense. Charge may be established by evidence of two or three witnesses. In, so I, I, I just want to emphasize again, all Christian needs to do, this is a command from God, that all Christians have to watch and make sure that if you see a Christian in sin and it's clear evidence in sin, we need to confront him, we need to show him, we need to reprove him and bring him back. But if he don't listen to you, then you have to bring one or two with you and and confront him. And this is, of course, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 19. It talk about uh, when, when you convict somebody, it has to be two or three witnesses. This is talking about the judicial situation. It's talking about in those times like criminal activities. That it has to come. It's just to show you that the seriousness of the situation. 
If a person in sin and he refused to, to, to um, repent, then you bring one or two and to confront him and to ask him to, to repent. And of course, you bring one or two together, you, you guard the procedure in not to be abused or unjust accusation. Sometimes we can be biased. So you bring two or three to make sure that this thing is not, uh, it's not a bias, but it's a clear evidence. Then if you don't listen to the two or three, then you go public in the church. Meaning, if you don't listen to the two or three, you tell it to the church. And I do not know how many of you have seen this procedure take, taken place. And how many churches are doing this. In fact, uh, not many. In fact, I, I would even think not even 1% of the churches are doing this. But you say that if, if a person sin, you go and talk to him one one one. If you refuse, bring two or three. And if you recently refuse to listen to two or three, you go in front of the church and say, this person sin and the whole church come to know about this. And when the whole church come to know, the whole church is supposed to ask him to repent. That's what it meant. Of course, when I was uh, uh, in, in, in studying in seminary, we see John MacArthur practice a number of times in this thing, and usually it's about adultery, meaning uh, the person uh, uh, divorce his own wife and, and go out and, uh, with, with another woman and so on. So it has to be very clear, and you have to tell and, and to warn the church that we cannot continue or condone uh, sins like, like this. So we have to go public and tell them. In fact, the, look at verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, the word refuses is almost like he ignore, he not, not taking heed, not listening. He said the word them is talking about the two or three. If you don't even listen to them, then you have to tell them to the public and ask them, remember the whole proceeding is really a redemptive, try to bring him back. But he, if he refused, then you, 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 you see that the verse that following is said, verse 17, the other half, if he refuses to listen even to the church, it's an escalation. The whole church doesn't know about this. The whole church wants you to repent. You don't even listen to the whole church. Then let him to you as Gentile and tax collector. Of course, when the Jews look down on Gentiles and tax collector, they treat them like an outsider. So it's like, oh, you're not belongs to us, you belong to... Uh, there comes many, many, many uh, scholars and many churches who say, look, our purpose is to go out and preach the gospel. So if, if we chase out these sinful brothers, then we have no chance. But I, I would like to say this to you. Yes, we are there to share gospel to all the unbelievers. But if there is a brother who called himself a Christian and yet continue in these sins, we have to treat them like tax collector or Gentile, meaning we are treating them like unbelievers. But they, are they allowed to continue in the church? Therefore, there's a question of whether you take a three-step approach or four-step approach. Three-step approach is continue. So if the person continue in sin, and then he, he sits in the church, and then he, he, he can boast about his sin, and we can do nothing. Don't you remember just now I mentioned that Paul said, a little leaven leavens the whole church, the whole lump. If you allow this little bit of sin continue, then everybody is, we, are, we, we, we totally disregard God's holy command, and we just do whatever we want. In fact, the Bible, if you stop here, then of course, you will say that, no, we need to love him like a loving an unbeliever, so we continue to let him sit here. But if you believe that the whole scripture has to be taken collectively as a whole, then you say, look, there's a fourth step, which I call prohibition. Why do I say that? If you look at 1 Corinthians, Paul said very clearly, in fact, besides 1 Corinthians, uh, Thessalonians, and also uh, John, uh, the third letter of John, also say the same thing. If you look at 1 Corinthians, we know that in 1 Corinthians that there is a, a so-called brother committed a very serious sin. That means this brother take his father's wife. This is incest. Basically, it's stepmother. 
He's basically having an uh, uh, <coughs> inappropriate relationship with the father's wife, meaning his ste stepmother. And the whole church did nothing. Paul said, this is totally not allowed. So 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 say, if actually, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and the kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his own, his father's wife, and you are, and you are arrogant. Out, ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be what removed from among you. So there is a fourth step. He not only okay, not only treat him like unbelievers. He has to remove from among you. You have to ask him to leave. Ask him to leave. And First Corinthians chapter. 5 verse 11 say the same thing. But I'm writing to you not to associate, not to associate, not to relate. To anyone who bears the name of a brother, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or, or greed, and it is an adulterer or reviler, or crunker or swindler, not even to eat with such a person. Now, is there a fourth step? Yes, he said, remove, not even to eat, not even to, to relate to, to, to one another. Verse 12 says, For what have I to do with judging outsider? Nothing. But it is not those inside the church that whom you are to judge. So the question is this, did the scripture ask us to do that? Yes. Then he said, purge. It has to be done. Now, I know, I was laughed at when I was in, in a, in a, in a, in a uh, pastor's fellowship in California. Uh, they invited me, so I went there and said, oh, you are from uh, Grace Community Church. Oh, you are, you are the, those people who cast out a Christian brother uh, when they are in sin. They all laugh at me. <laughs> so I, I, I remember vividly all this. But we, we should not listen to just what men thinks, what they, look at the scripture. What's the word purge the evil man from among you? What does it mean? Thessalonians chapter 3 uh, say the same thing. Chapter 3, basically chapter 3 is talking about the, the in fact, chapter 3 did talk about those unruly people. In fact, chapter 3 says that uh, he, Paul said he command all the believers to keep away from any brother who walks in idleness and not in accordance to the tradition that they receive. He, in fact, in verse 6, says, Now I command you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accordance to the tradition. So he's talking about, look, is there a first fourth step? Of course, he does. In Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14, says, If anyone does not obey what he, we say in this letter, take note of that person, have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. So is there a fourth step? If you take collectively the whole church, a uh, whole uh, scripture as one, you will un understand that there has to be a fourth step. In fact, John in John, 3 John said the same thing. He said, I have written something to the church, but... Diotrephus, who liked to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what is he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us, and not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers, and so also stop those who want to, and put them out of the church. So the question is this, is there a fourth step? I would say yes, there is a fourth step. So we have seen that. What is the purpose? If the purpose is redemptive. We have to bring back, is to bring back uh, wayward uh, brothers with, joy, with, with, with uh, hum humility, with grace, with gentleness. And the process is basically we take four, four step approach. And finally, the power of discipline. Does the church have power to do that? Does the church have authority to do that? That's where verse 18 says let's look at verse 18 verse 18 says truly I say to you whatever you buy on earth shall be bound in heaven whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven again I say to you if two of you two of you agree on earth about anything they ask it will be done for them by my father in heaven for where two or three agree 
are gathered in my name, there am I among you. In fact, this is a confirmation, first thing, by the God the Father, secondly, by God the Son. God the Father, first 18, said, Whoever, whatever you buy on earth shall be bound in heaven. It's almost a confirmation, it's almost a certainty. But of course, grammatically speaking, don't get this text wrong. It, there are many churches or, or even Roman Catholic will say that the, the power of the church is that if I buy a person, God the Father will bow because I buy. The answer is no, you, you don't have the power. You don't have the power. In fact, grammatically, it's a future perfect passive. Meaning, whatever already bound, God already bound, therefore we declare it's bound. How do I know? Because you clearly violated the word of God. If you clearly violated the word of God, you are following God's command to bind or lose. Just like when you say, I repent of my sin, I believe Jesus Christ is the Savior, and you, you, you want to uh, submit, uh, deny yourself and follow him. If you say, confess with your mouth, and repent of your life, I can proclaim, I can announce, say, you are saved. Where do I get the power? It's in the word of God. So, whatever, if we follow the word of God closely and obey the word of God, God the Father will do, will be pleased here. Not only that, God the Son as well. You see that Jesus said this, 19. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, there are, there are scholars who think that this is talking about prayer. This is totally not talking about prayer because in the context, it's still talking about church discipline. So it's basically saying that if two or three, who are the two or three? It's the, the two or three that go and confront him. This, they agree that, look, this is clear violation of God's command. Therefore, they will pronounce judgment. So he said, if two or three you agree, and God the Father in heaven would be done for you. And for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Meaning, God the Son is, endor is endorsing the decision here. So here, do we have the power to do to, do, to cast out a person or to chase a person out of the, from the church? Yes. If you clearly violate God's command, I, I just want to be very clear. It is clear command, violate, clear violation of clear command in the Bible, and it's a fact. It's not hearsay. And we have to do it. And why do we do all these things? Remember, I, we are studying the, Matthew, the book of Matthew, we have come to, to this stage. Jesus is about to embark the journey to Jerusalem and to be hanged on the cross. Remember, I, I talk about this. The book of Matthew, we see the genealogy of the, of the king because the whole book is talking about the king. Then we see uh, some of the mouth, the, the manifesto of the king. Then we see that he, he showed his power, meaning he manifests his own power and authority. And what happened? The people rejected him. So after they rejected him, what do they do? What does Jesus is about to do? He is about to embark on the journey to Jerusalem to be killed and crucified on the cross. But before he go there, chapter 18 tells us, after I go there, I, I, will be, I, will be, I will be killed, but I need you to know that as a church, after I'm being killed and departed from there, as a church, do you know how to function? And this is what chapter 18 is all about. Therefore, when we understand this is the will of God for the church, now, do we do church of discipline? We will. In fact, we have passed, but we have not reached the, the, the last stage. We, but we are, why are we doing this? Because purity, holiness is important. We are not saying that. I know we, all of us and none of us are per perfect. None of us are sinless. But if anyone comes to us and say, you violated clear command, and we look at that, Thanks for telling me, and we repent. And, and you, the person who confronts you, should not even tell a second person. 
And this church discipline, it should be done on first level and it should be widespread. And everybody doing that, then you are doing this for the Lord and the purity of the church is preserved. Then we will not end up in the newspaper. And I think it's important. And I hope to, that you see this seriously. Why do we come to church? We want to be holy as what the Lord expects. And this is what we will do. Shall we pray together? Father, we come before you. We know it's a serious topic, but we know it is your clear command. So may you give us strength. May you humble ourselves. May we all willing to be subject to uh, church discipline. Um, if someone uh, come to us and see our, our fault and see our sin, that may you give us our humble heart and willing to accept. And may all this thing done in private, and, and during our first step that we will all repent and give glory to your name. So give us strength, give us grace, give us love when we do all this for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.